the iconic scenic shoreline of Cape Cod. From the entrance to the Cape Cod Canal, to Cape Cod National Seashore, to Provincetown and the shores of Cape Cod Bay. A local art form still practiced a century after it began. We consider Pier Point Glass uh, a piece of American history. Saving salt marshes. We've lost almost 70% of our salt marsh uh, since the early 1700s. And an offshore harvest at the southeast corner of the Cape. I enjoyed the challenge of it. I enjoyed the freedom of it. Now, 50,000 kilometers of eastern coastline are revealed from above. An aerial journey over America's rugged Atlantic frontier. This is America over the edge. Just one hour's drive south of the city of Boston, the Massachusetts mainland meets America's most famous cape. Cape Cod is an iconic geographic landmark, a crooked arm of land extending 100 kilometers offshore. But the cape is also a geological landmark and from the air, we gain a unique perspective on its formation. During the last ice age, Cape Cod marked the southernmost boundary for three major ice sheets. The curved edges or lobes of those sheets deposited the rock and debris that determined the shape of the Cape today. Beginning at the western end of the Cape, we fly high above a modern marvel that altered the geography of this region forever. The Cape Cod Canal connects Cape Cod Bay with Buzzards Bay to the west. And from the air, the scope of this effort can be truly understood. a massive project transforming Cape Cod into an island. The Cape Cod Canal began construction in 1909 and was opened five years later. Then from 1935 to 1940, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers widened this maritime highway, making it the widest sea level canal ever built. Today, the Cape Cod Canal is used by 14,000 vessels each year, saving mariners 200 kilometers navigating around the Cape. Just east of the canal and high above the shoulder of Cape Cod, East Sandwich Beach marks the perimeter of Cape Cod Bay a curved waterway formed by the lobe of the Cape Cod Bay ice sheet thousands of years ago. This stretch of coast is known as the Upper Cape, one of four geographic regions on Cape Cod. The Upper Cape is the section of land closest to the mainland, extending south from Cape Cod Bay to Nantucket Sound. Just inland, the landscape changes as Cape Cod's famous salt marshes stretch as far as the eye can see. Salt marshes and estuaries can be found all over Cape Cod, here along Cape Cod Bay, or miles to the east along Cape Cod's Atlantic coast.
salt marshes are located where fresh water meets the sea, with that fresh water picking up nutrient-rich soil along its route. While from the ground they may seem insignificant, from a bird's eye view, their rich colors and ecological diversity can be seen. Salt marshes mark one of the most biologically productive ecosystems on Earth, a critical habitat for fish, shellfish, and bird life. And throughout the Cape Cod region, salt marshes are at risk. Ellisville Marsh is a estuary, a very small estuary, about 75 acres total. Um, it's fed by a small channel that leads from the ocean into the marsh proper. Well, this marsh serves as migratory stopover ground for many species of birds. It's a nursery habitat for fish species. Uh, the marsh itself is a sponge, so to speak, during storm surge, during sea level rise, as, as we experience that, the marsh will become even more critical to maintaining our coastline and preventing erosion. Ellisville Marsh is located just north of the Cape Cod Canal an estuary that has been important to local residents for centuries. Historically, in the early 1700s, this area was quite remote, not developed. Uh, Henry David Thoreau actually was one of the visitors to a local tavern. He described local inhabitants here hand dredging the channel for access for their boats out to the ocean. There were Native Americans here that used this estuary um, as a source of shellfish, fish, for, for their livelihood. Um, early settlers, fishermen primarily, were using the inlet to um, send fish for mackerel, for cod, fish that were very prevalent back in, in the day. But in 1987, the state of Massachusetts put a ban on dredging here, ending a centuries-old practice of maintaining a channel linking the marsh and the sea. Local residents immediately noticed a change. The first visible clue was large mats of algae. They looked almost like paper forming on top of the open water areas of the marsh. And slowly the Spartina alterniflora, the primary grass in the marsh, began to die off. For the Northeast region, uh, we've lost almost 70% of our salt marsh uh, since the early 1700s. So preserving even the 75 acre areas is, is critical to maintaining the very valuable functions that salt marshes have. Activists spent two years convincing the government to end the ban on dredging. Their efforts were a success. Friends of Ellisville Marsh was formed, a nonprofit organization, to attempt to restore the health of the marsh. In 2010, the inlet was first dredged, and there was an immediate response of the marsh, um, an increase in tidal range, not as many boggy, stagnant areas on the marsh. Today, the marsh has been reconnected to the sea. And while locals say conditions have improved, Ellen Russell is conducting long-term studies to monitor the health of this seaside ecosystem. This represents one of our vegetation plots um, that we sample every year. We have 100 total across the marsh. So we use this plot frame to orient our uh, vegetation survey properly so that we can repeat it from year to year in the same location. And this central thing is a, a piezometer that we sample pore water from if we want to do some chemical analysis such as salinity. So a typical salt marsh has different species present, oh, about 11 different species, and they all have their own unique salinity and flooding requirements in order to survive. 
So for this plot, I'm going to write that this is essentially 100% Spartina patens, which is a high marsh plant, um, indicating that this marsh area is not inundated as frequently as, say, these taller grasses on the marsh. So one of the other things that I do is to measure salinity of the pore water within the marsh, which is an indicator of how frequently or how fresh the system is. So to do that, I take a small amount of water, place it on this refractometer, which is, measures the amount of total dissolved solids in the water itself. And right now I'm getting a reading of about 29% or parts per thousand salinity for this ditch water here. Ellen Russell's work serves multiple purposes. It is part of her PhD research in environmental science. It is also used by the Friends of Ellisville Marsh and provided to the state for analysis. The overall goal of doing this vegetation assessment is to determine whether or not the productivity, the primary plant productivity of the marsh is impacted by the dredging itself in a good way or in a bad way. And from what we are seeing, there's a, a definite balance that's being maintained by keeping this inlet situation dredged and open. Ellen Russell hopes her work will contribute to the long-term health of the Ellisville coastal region an area she holds dear to her heart. The marsh has a, a, an aesthetic appeal that really you can't put into words. The, those of us who live around here um, rely on the green every summer. My family has had this home here for about 110 years. My great grandmother wrote a journal of her, her daily events, which was pretty mundane, but there are a lot of special things about this place, uh, weighing her children in the fish scales down at the fish house in the marsh, um, the fact that a thousand pounds of mackerel were harvested in a day, things like that that I'd like to see continue. And as a child, I, I played in the marsh below. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Back to the waters of Cape Cod Bay and continuing east, Sandy Neck Beach is a spectacular sight. It is one of the longest beaches on Cape Cod, and from above, nearly all of its rolling hills can be seen. And Sandy Neck Beach marks a geographic boundary as we leave the Upper Cape behind and enter the Mid Cape. The Mid Cape is the bicep of Cape Cod a sandy stretch of land extending further offshore. Sandy Neck Beach is considered by the Nature Conservancy to be one of the best barrier beach systems in the Northeast ecoregion. Now at the end of Sandy Neck and around Beach Point, a unique corner of Cape Cod is revealed. Sandy Neck Colony is marked by just a few dozen summer residences. Many were built more than a century ago and have no road access. They can only be reached by off-road vehicle through the sand or by boat, and at low tide, that can be a challenge. On Sandy Neck, sand is a way of life. 
It's no surprise sand is the backbone of a key Cape Cod industry and local artistic tradition. Cape Cod Glass. Cape Cod has been a, a center of glass making uh, for centuries, really. And Parapoint Glass is the oldest glass blowing company in the United States. They use techniques that date back centuries and a process that begins with a resource familiar to Cape Codders as sand is transformed into liquid glass. All right, so this is uh, our manufacturing floor. Sammy here is uh, gathering the glass out of the furnace. There's a big pot where the glass is liquefied. It's melted at 2,150 degrees. He takes it on a gathering rod, brings it ultimately over to Ian and Guy who are on the bench and sit at the glory hole where they ultimately will shape their piece, size their piece, and create beautiful glass. It melted a consistency that allows him to gather the glass in its liquid form on the hot rod. Ian Ross is a second generation glass blower with nearly 25 years of experience. Now I've got the glass that I need to make the piece the proper amount. And this is just to cool the iron down because I went into the furnace so far that it's hot that I can't touch the iron down the pipe. So this cools it down so that I can touch it. Now I'm gonna block it and put it into a shape to go into a mold to put ribs on it. And I'm gonna give it a quick little reheat in the glory hole. Yeah, we reheat it so that the, the glass is softer and hotter, that the ribs will stand out more. Now I've forced air into the iron and I have my thumb over the end and it's gonna give way to the hot glass here. See that bubble coming through now? Now I go back into the glory hole to reheat it. The glass started at 2,150 degrees, but within seconds it cools down. It'll move till it's about 1,000 degrees. Once it gets below 1,000 degrees, it'll stop moving and you can't work it anymore. That's why we keep having to reheat it in the glory hole. From here, Ross shapes the glass. Now I'm shaping the, uh, the piece to where I want it. This will actually end up to be the top of the piece, up near the iron. This will be the bottom, so I'm, I'm setting it up so I can shear it, make it even. So now I've got it to about the size that I want and the length and Sam Wells is gonna bring over a, a foot and I'm gonna add a cobalt blue foot to the base. This is right about just over a thousand degrees. If I was to stop moving this, it still might move a little bit. I'm pretty close to the brink of where it'll move and where it won't. Once it's the size and length Ross wants, his coworker will bring more soft glass for a series of additions, including a foot or base to the creation. So now Sam Well is heating up a stick up or a pontal, which I'll apply to the bottom of the piece so that I can work the top of the piece.
But before Ross can finish, they must reheat the glass again. A non-stop process to ensure the glass stays at a workable temperature. Back at the bench, he continues to shape the piece until he is satisfied. And there's the piece. We're gonna go put it in the leer. Now he's putting it in the leer. Um, the leer is an annealing piece of equipment. If we were just to leave that out, it would cool down too fast and blow up and break, so it has to cool down slowly, increments over the period of the night. So we put this in here at 950 degrees, and at the end of the day, we, turn it, we seal it up, turn it off, and then it cools down very slowly throughout the period of the night, which makes it so it won't blow up and break. It's a very important part of the process. The work Ross has created today is just one of thousands created at Parapoint admired here by visitors for decades. Pearpoint's known all over the world um, for its art glass, uh, for its glassware, dinnerware, um, practical uh, pieces uh, used in the home, uh, decorative glass items. Really, anything that can be made of glass, we make here. For Ian Ross and Gary Tolman, Glass blowing is a true Cape Cod legacy that is close to their hearts. I got into this because my father was a glass blower. He's actually one of the people that um, came here in 1970 and restarted this company. Uh, he was a glass blower in Scotland and they were looking for skilled craftsmen at the time and they went to Scotland and three guys came over here and started this factory up and it's just something that I've always been interested in and always wanted to do. We consider uh, Pierpoint Glass uh, a piece of American history. And the fact that it is the oldest operating glass works in the country, it's incredibly satisfying to every day see beautiful pieces of art uh, made from scratch. Twenty kilometers southeast of Sandwich, and the sandy traditions of Cape Cod Bay, one of the Cape's best known communities can be found mid-Cape, along the Atlantic waters of Nantucket Bay. Hyannis is located at a narrow point on the Cape, with the waters of Cape Cod Bay still visible in the distance. Now heading north along Great Island into Lewis Bay, the village of Hyannis is revealed. Its historic shopping district makes it a tourist attraction. And its ferry to the island of Nantucket makes it a regional transportation hub. Hyannis is one of the most affluent areas on the entire East Coast and has been called the All-American City and the heart of Cape Cod. Just to the west, Hyannis Port is one of America's most famous and truly exclusive communities. known as the site of the Kennedy Compound. Here, three massive homes covering 24,000 square meters have served as a home and summer residence to generations of Kennedys, including President John F. Kennedy. And while the exclusive homes of Hyannisport are fenced and blocked from view on the ground, in the air, history can truly be felt. 
It was here that JFK awaited the results of the 1960 presidential election, where he signed legislation establishing the Cape Cod National Seashore, and where his brother, Senator Ted Kennedy, lived until his death in 2009. Hyannisport remains one of the most famous addresses in America, surrounded by pristine coastline that is said to have inspired the late president himself. Not far away, a monument bears an inscription known well to locals. I believe it is important that this country sail and not sit still in the harbor. It is a JFK quote that lives on in Lewis Bay and the waters surrounding. Moving beyond Hyannis and Hyannisport, the waters of Nantucket Sound extend to the east. This is the town of Dennisport, home to just over 3,000 residents. It's famous for its beaches and breakwaters. And it is located just kilometers from some of the region's top fishing and farming areas. Cynthia Sutfin lives in the community of Harwich and has been harvesting one of Cape Cod's most unique crops for more than a decade. Lavender is an herbaceous shrub. It uh, is a very versatile plant. It can be used for culinary purposes, for medicinal purposes, uh, relaxation, and uh, visual beauty. I started growing lavender because nobody else in the area was growing it. And I wanted to do something that was unique, and um, that was 20 years ago. Surrounding Sutphin's house, lavender fields flourish through the peaceful spring and early summer. That is followed by a hectic harvest. During harvest time, um, it's a bit of a frenzy because everything comes to bloom pretty much at the same time. We pick everything by hand. Once the harvest is complete, Sutphin works in the lavender shop to turn her crop into something special. Here we are at our lavender shop. This is where we hang all the beautiful lavender we pick to dry. We have many products for sale as well, and I might make a wreath or two. Today, she is preparing a work of art. Here we are, we're going to make a wreath now. We sell lots of lavender products in the shop, um, soaps and lotions and candles and fresh bunches up on the ceiling there that are my favorite things, as well as making a lavender wreath. So I just take a handful like this and cut it into a smaller, smaller bunch and then lay it on top, covering the green tape there. And I'll just add another piece of tape to secure this and I'll just move around the whole wreath until it's complete. One of the beauties of lavender is that as it dries, the scent intensifies and this um, wreath will smell for hundreds of years. Um, in order to refresh the scent, you just pinch the buds because that's where the oil, the oil sacs are contained in these little buds. And as they dry, the, the scent intensifies. So. so this wreath will outlive me in terms of fragrance, that's for sure. Cynthia Sutphin has built her home and her life around her lavender fields in Harwich. It feels very good to have started this nice farm and tradition of lavender and lavender products and appreciation of gardening and the beauties of what you can produce. We've gone from selling 100 plants in a season to about 3,000 plants. I'm very fortunate to live in this location. I thank my stars every day when I walk around and appreciate 
where I live. 20 kilometers southeast of Cape Cod's lavender farm, South Monomoy Island is located just off the elbow of Cape Cod. And from high above sea level, we have the rare chance to experience two incredible views. To the north, Cape Cod National Seashore lines the Outer Cape and the Atlantic coast. From here, nearly all of Cape Cod's perimeter can be seen. And directly south, the distant silhouette of Nantucket lines the horizon. Appropriately, the name Nantucket comes from the native Wampanoag language, meaning faraway land or island. Now, heading north again and closer to sea level, details of South Monomoy Island are revealed. The island is actually a protected area with no road access, part of the Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge. The refuge is made up of two islands, Monomoy North and South. Together, they measure more than 7,000 acres and extend 13 kilometers off the Cape Cod coast. The refuge features diverse landscapes, including oceanfront, salt and freshwater marshes, dune systems, and freshwater ponds. It is also a habitat for a variety of animal life, including migratory shorebirds and an incredible seal population. Some can be seen lying on the beaches of South Monomoy, while dozens more swim in the shallow waters off North Monomoy. Finally, just north of Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge, Cape Cod's mainland comes into view, along with one of its most historic towns. Chatham marks the third geographic region of the Cape, known as the Lower Cape. It is here at the elbow of Cape Cod, where the shoreline curves to the north. This area has been inhabited by Native Americans for centuries, with European exploration beginning in the early 17th century. With its proximity to the sea and its sheltered harbor, Chatham quickly became a key port for shipping and for fishing. And from the air, Chatham's modern fishing fleet carries on that legacy. Each year, fleets from Chatham to Provincetown haul more than 9 million kilograms of fish. And today, the fleet is especially active. It's the first day of lobster season. So we're here at the Chatham Fish Pier, which is where my boat, The Lost, is kept on its mooring. We're going to head out through the break in the barrier beach, uh, what we call the Chatham Inlet. And we're going to travel approximately three to four miles offshore where I've set gear. The inlet that we're gonna travel through is probably one of the most dangerous on the East Coast due to the fact that there's deep water on the outside but a very shallow spot on the inside. So it can be quite treacherous for the boats to travel over due to the fact that uh, breaking waves and, and strong currents can uh, affect the boat and its maneuverability quite drastically. Chatham is home to several dozen small fishing operators and Nick Muto has been part of the fleet for just over a decade. Really with this being the first haul, it's kind of a, a shot in the dark as to our first set for the year. So if we can do one or two lobsters, I'll be, I'll be real happy with that. Hopefully we can do a few more, but uh, we'll, we'll wait and see what we catch when we get out there. But before they begin hauling in today's catch, they will unload the pots they have on board. Because the tide's running the way it is right now, we're gonna set up, we're gonna, the tide is running to the north. 
So we set gear with the tide. Mark our ends differently so that other fishermen know the direction that we're setting. If they run into my high flyer, they know that my gear goes north from there. If they run into this small north end, they know that the gear goes south from there. Just hang on a second to letting the pot out. And one by one, 15 traps in a row that are tied together with a short piece of rope called a ganjin joins all these 15 pots together. 15 pots together it makes a trawl of lobster gear. We'll haul anywhere between 15 and 20, 20 trawls every time that we're out lobstering. The whole trawl ends up spanning about a half a mile. This is the most dangerous part of the job right here. Uh, setting out gear um, is always something you want to pay extra close attention to. Uh, the wrong roll of the, the boat the wrong way can knock the stack of pots over. The rope could go out tangled up and pull out two pots at the same time and consequently drag my crewman over with it. We're not running very fast right now. I'm keeping a close eye on my crewman, um, keeping a close eye on the line going overboard, all while trying to make sure I set a straight line. Finally, the deck is cleared. That yellow one's the last one, Glenn. That's setting lobster gear. We're going to be fishing in an area known as Crab Ledge. It used to be fishing grounds for things like pollock, codfish, uh, blackback flounders. But now, primarily, uh, most guys just fish for lobster here. What we're going to do now is check some of the pots that we set five days ago to see how we're going to do this season. Right away, they get a lobster, but it's a catch they won't be able to keep. So what we've got here is an egg-bearing female. These lobsters were not allowed to keep. We put these back in the water so that uh, the female can lay its eggs and we can make sure we have a healthy stock for the future. Um, so it's, it's illegal to keep those or take any of the eggs off, disrupt the eggs. What we want to do is throw it over so that it lands on its back so that it doesn't disrupt the eggs. Just like that. But the next haul is a success. Ah, oh, look at this, heroes. Wow. Wow, that's a nice lobster. They retrieved their first legal lobster of the season and reset the pot. So what we're doing here, Glenn's pulling the lobsters out of the pot, checking for eggs, um, looking at size, changing the bait bags out. He's putting it back in the stack, rebaiting it, getting it ready to set out again. As the day progresses, it quickly becomes clear. Opening day of lobster season has been a success. That's probably a four pound lobster, three and a half, probably worth between 20 and 25 bucks. We hauled our 15 lobster pots for the day and to my surprise, we probably caught 20 pounds of lobsters. Um, being our first haul of the season, I never really expect to do too well. So to see that kind of lobstering, we had a good sign of uh, not only saleable lobsters, but some egg-bearing females and some small lobsters that were too, too small to sell. So all the signs look really good for the year. For Nick Muto, being a part of Chatham's fishing fleet has been an incredible experience, taking part in one of the most historic fisheries on the Atlantic coast. 14 years ago, I fell in love with fishing. I enjoyed the challenge of it. I enjoyed the freedom of it. I enjoyed the labor of it. It's, it's a, a lot of guys call it a love of labor, and because there's, there's never any shortage of work. 
Uh, and it, it's something you've, you've truly got to enjoy to, to keep doing it every day. If, if, if you hate it, it will destroy you from the inside out. So the guys, every guy on the water, I think deep down may complain, although they may complain about it, deep down we love it. And I don't think we'd have it any other way. Heading north, we approach the fourth and final region of Cape Cod. This is known as the Outer Cape, or the stretch of Cape closest to the waters of the Atlantic. And here, one of America's most famous shorelines extends as far as the eye can see. Cape Cod National Seashore is a protected coastal expanse. 64 kilometers of sandy beaches, from Chatham in the south to Provincetown in the north. And from the sky, once again, we have the rare opportunity to understand how America's most famous cape came to be. Cape Cod National Seashore and all of the Outer Cape was formed by a moraine or a massive deposit of glacial material at the intersection of two giant ice sheets, the Cape Cod Bay Ice Sheet and the South Channel Ice Sheet. Over time, erosion has formed these spectacular cliffs and the sandy beaches below. Cape Cod National Seashore attracts more than four million visitors each year, drawn by its beauty, its many recreation opportunities, and its scenic seclusion. But the seashore may be best described by author Henry David Thoreau, who said, a man may stand there and put all America behind him. Now 20 kilometers north of Chatham, one of the few landmarks along Cape Cod's national seashore comes into view. Nauset Light was originally built along the Chatham coast in 1877, a cast iron and brick tower standing 12 meters high. Then in 1923, it was disassembled and moved to this stretch of seashore known as Nosset Beach. But it wasn't long before the light would need to move again. By 1996, coastal erosion forced authorities to move Nosset Light 50 meters inland, away from a steep cliff face. Locals hope it will continue to be a beacon for years to come. And beyond Nosset Light, Marconi Beach is another historic stop along Cape Cod National Seashore. It was here in 1903 that Julio Marconi successfully completed the first two-way transatlantic signal as President Theodore Roosevelt and England's King Edward VII communicated via Morse code.
Marconi's operation here, known as the South Wellfleet Station, would become the lead site in North America for ship-to-shore transmissions, with business and social messages sent for 50 cents a word. Next, beyond Marconi Beach, and from high above, Cape Cod's position on the East Coast can truly be put in context. From above Cape Cod National Seashore, the skyline of Boston can be seen, 100 kilometers to the northwest. Now heading northwest and closer to shore, the town of Provincetown is one of the gems of this shoreline, situated at the tip of Cape Cod. It is home to just 3,000 people, but in summer months that number can rise to as high as 60,000. Tourists drawn to one of the most historic and culturally progressive hubs on the Atlantic seaboard. Its culture can be found in its many restaurants, clubs and summer festivals, while its history is represented by Provincetown's incredible Pilgrim Monument rising more than 75 meters. The monument is the tallest all granite structure in the United States, honoring the pilgrims who landed here in 1620 before settling in Plymouth on the opposite side of Cape Cod Bay. Finally, at the end of Cape Cod, Long Point extends west of Provincetown and curls, creating a sheltered harbor. During the American Civil War, Long Point was home to an artillery post and garrison. Today, the only landmark here is Long Point Light. Rising seven meters from the sea, a light has stood here since 1827, marking the entrance to Provincetown and the end of America's most famous cape. from the historic Cape Cod Canal. To the enclave of Hyannisport and the world famous Kennedy compound. To Provincetown and a soaring monument to the early pilgrims. Cape Cod is a mix of history and beauty. And from the air, there is even more to witness. Kilometers of stunning dunes beyond the road network. A centuries old fishing legacy thriving off Cape Cod's coastal communities. and the majesty of the Cape itself. A world of wonder that continues to inspire. Here on the edge of America. <laughs>